Well, once again, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, as we look here at the Word of God. We are uh, now looking uh, at this transition that is taking place in chapter 5 and chapter 4. Uh, the Apostle Paul was there uh, answering the question of what happens to the dead after they die, and so they, they are resurrected, and so at the same time uh, of the resurrection or just after the resurrection almost at the same time uh, there's going to be the rapture that takes place and then in chapter 5 he shifts gears and he says now uh, as to the times and epochs and so as we look at that word now now is a shifting of gears is a changing of things it's a changing of directions he's no longer talking about uh, the saved now he's shifting gears towards the lost what happened at the second coming of Jesus Christ with the saved it's not actually the second coming the second coming doesn't happen all the way until after the end of uh, the tribulation but what happens to those who are saved uh, the resurrection and the rapture but what happens to those who are lost you have the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord as we spoke about last week is going to be a time of great wrath and so when we look at this we begin to understand it uh, we look in God's word it says right here now as to times and the epics brethren you have no need of any thing to be written to you and so the times and the epics he said it, it, there, there, there's no need of anything being written to you about these things and so you in other words you don't need any further instruction uh, Paul already talked to them about this Paul already discussed this in great detail apparently about this and so as we look at this he says in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5 he says do you not remember that while I was still with you I I was telling you these things and so uh, uh, these things uh, the, the resurrection the rapture the day of the Lord these are things that he had already in person when he was with them physically discussed with them but when we look at this we we, we find further understanding that, uh, that when it comes to the times and it, when it comes to the epics of specifically the day of the Lord it, you know there's no need to talk about these things is what he's saying there's no need to give you further instruction and further direction about these things you know, I believe uh, as Christians we, we can often get caught up in uh, in time events we can also often get caught up in uh, looking at you know the signs and you know when are these things going to take place how are they going to take place what's going to be all of the signs surrounding them and are we seeing the signs and I believe we are seeing signs today but we need to be careful in those things that we don't get so caught up in those things that we're just looking towards the clouds constantly looking for the signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ when we understand that God has a work for us to do right here right now today amen God has us a task to fulfill at the very present yes Jesus is coming back he says as you well know and so you know th th there's no need uh, now uh, as, as to the times and epics brethren you have no need of anything to be written uh, to you and he goes on in verse 2 for you yourself know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night so you already know you understand this is going to happen th this is uh, ingrained with you that the day of the Lord in other words the second coming of Jesus Christ it is going to take place I don't need to convince you of that fact you know full well but when then you get back to the times and you get back to the epics well what in the world is he talking about there when we begin to look in the Word of God we begin to understand times and epics first of all time what is a time a time is a specific time it is a set time it is an appointed time as you look in the word of God and here it is they say there's no need for me to discuss these things with you those there's, no, there's no need for me to write these things down about uh, about these certain things now there are certain things that were set in stone and, and and the day of the second coming is set in stone but we don't need to dwell upon that specific day of that specific time of that specific appointment that is going to take place we just need to know it's going to happen Amen? 
Now, as we look at the fact that God has set certain things in a very specific time, we look in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, and He was born of a virgin that was under the law. And so when we look at this, we understand that God fulfilled that appointment time. Amen. And so that's what Paul's talking about. Yes, there's a day that's coming and yes, it is an appointed time and nothing and no one is going to change that appointed time. But I'm not here to talk about that with you is what he's saying. We also see in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 he says, for why we were still helpless at the right time. At that very specific appointed time, why we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? We're the ungodly. Every single one of us are the right, are, are the ungodly. But why we were helpless, what were we helpless to do? We were helpless to do anything about our ungodly state. So what happened at the right time, at that very spot, specific appointed time God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us amen and God's timing is absolutely perfect and so in the fullness of time Jesus came and Jesus was born at the right time Jesus died for us and we were saved amen and so when we look at that we also look at the word epoch and so when we look at that word say what in the world is that it might be translated as season uh, within your translation translation and so that's really what it is it's a season it's an epic and so it's not just a season as we think of seasons we think of seasons as being you know spring summer fall and winter and so we have four seasons we don't really have four seasons here in south mississippi you know uh, here it is it's the first sunday of september and everybody's getting all excited all right fall is coming and we're so we're going to have that first week of false fall and then summer is going to kick back in amen <laughs> be 90 something degrees all of a sudden before we but before we know it and so we don't ever know what's going to happen with our crazy weather systems that we have down here uh, in the deep south but God has set up uh, you know spring summer and fall God has set up those seasons and so that's something that God has established I lived in North Dakota for a little while and never will forget one of the very first things I saw was in the airport at Bismarck North Dakota it was a sweatshirt and it said North Dakota it has six seasons. It said it had spring, summer, fall, and winter, winter, winter. Amen. And it did. I tell you what, that was the most brutal winter I've ever experienced within, uh, within my life. But it's those seasons. But, but it can be, uh, the, the epics can even be beyond seasons as we normally think of as seasons. It could be uh, also the festivals that the Jewish, uh, the Jews celebrated. They had those set times of, uh, you know, having certain festivals and they were going to happen uh, in a seasonal way. As, as, uh, you know, it's tradition for us. It's tradition in our house. We start celebrating Christmas uh, that, that uh, the night of Thanksgiving. And so that, that very night, we start celebrating Christmas, and that enters into the Christmas season, if you will. And so it may, may not be a weather-related season, but certainly is a season for us as we begin to celebrate uh, those times. You know, uh, Mississippi is about to have a phenomenally important event that is about to take place far greater than the Super Bowl, far greater than the World Series, far greater uh, than, than the Final Four, any of those things things we're about to have cruising on the coast take place here in South Mississippi and, and I mean that is a phenomenal event and so you know when we think about that there's already 10,000 cars that are registered for that and not the, the pre-registered and so not to mention it's when classic cars literally come from all over the world met somebody from Australia one time that brought their car to South Mississippi to come all the way over here uh, to cruising on the coast and so a lot of people asked their during this time, you know, uh, I'm on their Facebook page, and I'd hate to be one of their moderators because it aggravates me, and I'm not one of their moderators. Everybody asks, when it, what, what's the dates for cruising on the coast? It always starts the first Sunday of October. 
No matter what, except for the year of Katrina, they didn't have it. It always starts. This is the 26th year, the first Sunday of October. It's always going to start. So it is a set season, if you will. It's an epic. It, it is a set time frame that, that you're going to have from that Sunday to the following Sunday all week long is going to be cruising on the coast down here in Mississippi. It ought to be titled Creeping on the Coast as you try to drive down there and you're driving about five miles an hour and it takes you four hours to get down Highway 90 down there. But I love it. I enjoy it. And so as, as we look at it, these set seasons that God has, uh, well, God didn't set up cruising on the coast, I don't think. But as we look at these seasons and these different time frames that we have, here it is, God has established the spring, summer, winter, and fall. And God has set up for the Jewish people these festivals that they have and these celebrations uh, that they have. In fact, we find in the Word of God, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, it says, it is He, it's God, it is He who changes the times and the epics and removes moves kings and establishes kings. God is the one who is in sovereign control. Amen. God is the one who has established these things and it's even God if he so chooses to change these things. It is God that is going to change these things. We don't even need to be focused on those. Paul said, I'm not, I'm not even writing to you about those things. You know, sometimes people say, you know, oh, Jesus is going to come back after this Jewish festival or after that Jewish festival. And every time we, you know, we, we get a, a, one of those times, you know, we see a, a blood moon out there. Oh, Jesus is coming back. And he might. Right? He might during that time. Or, or you know, uh, you always hear it during the time of Pentecost, right? The Jewish festival of Pentecost. Well, Jesus is going to come back right after. And he might. But our focus should be upon the work that we have right here, right now, today. Amen? Paul said, I'm not going to write to you about those things. I'm going to tell you about the day of the Lord. I'm going to tell you about the things that are going to take place. And so, you know, when, when we look at this, even Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7, He said, uh, he said to them, it is not for you to know times our epics, it kind of sounds like Paul is quoting Jesus here, right? He said, it's not for you to know times or epics which the Father has fixed by His own authority. Yes, there is a set time, and yes, there is a set season, but it's not for you to know it. Amen? It's not for me to know. It's not for anybody else to know it. You know, when we look at this and begin to understand, we, we flip on over. I want you to flip your Bibles, if we will, to Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to be looking in there for a, a bit. And so as we look here at this text of Scripture, Matthew chapter 24, and you know, talking about the things of the end and things that are going to take place in the end. We look uh, here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 23. We recognize here in the Word of God that, you know, uh, uh, certain things are mentioned of how certain things are going to take place and how certain things are going to be. And so we, we find the very words of Jesus in Matthew 24 and 23. Uh, it says right here, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. Because we have a lot of that. Oh, Jesus is coming on this specific day. Don't believe him. Are, are there Jesus is over there? You better not believe him. Because the day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back, listen, everybody is going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. Every eye is going to behold Him. And there will not be any doubt that is Jesus Christ. So we don't have to sit and wonder and ponder when He's coming back. We're either going to see Him as Christians in death or in the rapture, one or the other. But friends, you could rest assured he's coming back and when he comes back there'd be no doubt whatsoever that's him that's Jesus that is the king of kings and the lord of lords that is almighty God and he's coming back on the day of the lord he's coming back on the day of vengeance he's coming back to claim what is his 
Friends, when we look around and say we get caught up in all of these signs and we need to be very, very careful in getting caught up in all of these signs because when we get caught up in all of these signs, always seeking signs, Jesus himself said it's an evil and perverse generation that seek for signs. Amen? It's an evil, perverse generation that's seeking for signs. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't tell us that there's certain signs that will take place in Matthew 24 and verse 29. This is what Jesus had to say about his coming, of the fact that there'll be no doubt about this fact. It says, but immediately after the tribulation. So when is the second coming going to be? Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation. Of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. So what sign are they going to see? They're going to see the ultimate sign. They're going to see the sign of the Son of Man coming in great power and great glory. When, it's going, when is it going to be? The Bible very clear. Jesus very clearly tells us after the tribulation. And what's going to happen? All of the people of the earth are going to mourn. Why are they going to mourn? They're going to mourn because a greater O moment has occurred. They have rejected the King of glory. And they know it. And it's too late. It's too late. See, the rapture is going to take place. That the rapture takes place is going to take every Christian upon the earth out of here. Then immediately the tribulation is going to kick into gear. We're going to have seven years of tribulation. And will there be people that's going to be saved during the time of the tribulation? Absolutely, there's going to be people that will be saved. In fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 7, uh, the Bible tells us right there it's going to be an innumerable amount of people that's going to be saved during the tribulation. It was asked, where do these people come from? Uh, that came out of the tribulation is what the Word of God says. Absolutely, they're going to be saved. But from the midpoint of the tribulation on, according to Revelation chapter 9, no one else is going to be saved. From the midpoint of the tribulation on, nobody else is going to repent. And of those who are saved during the first part of the tribulation, they're going to be put to death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, by the time Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, everybody there that is on the face of this earth is going to be lost. And it's going to be a great uh uh-oh moment. They're going to grieve. They're going to mourn according to the word of God because they have realized that they have missed the king of glory. They heard about him. They heard the gospel, but they rejected. They heard about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but they have rejected. They heard about the suffering servant of how he came to this world and he humbled himself and became a man and he went to the cross and he died for them, but they rejected. They heard the gospel, but they rejected the gospel. They heard about the love of God, but they rejected the love of God. They heard about the grace of God, but they rejected the grace of God. And now their time of opportunity has come to a halt. They have no more opportunity. The day of grace is gone. No longer living under the day of grace, they're going to grieve and they're going to mourn. That time is no more. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, he said this. He said, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now think about this. If we did know the day and the hour, (laughs) what would we do? Amen? Amen? I mean, you think about those teenagers that are at home and mama says she's going to be home at 6 o'clock and what are they doing? They're doing whatever they wanted to until about 5.45 and all of a sudden they're cleaning up, they're straightening up. 
They're getting everything ready. Right? Because mama's coming home. And you don't want to reap the wrath of mama if she realizes that you're not doing what she told you to do. But when you know it's getting closer to her coming home or you know it's time of getting closer to daddy coming home, then you're going to start getting things ready. Amen? When I was a teenager, I thought I was smart. thought I was cunning. I thought I could get away with things that I couldn't actually get away with. My dad used to ride his bike to work every now and then. Whenever he'd ride his bike to work, you know what I'd do? He'd always leave before I left uh, I left the school. And he'd always get home after I got home from school. So I thought, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to take the car to school. I'm going to get away with it too. And I did for a little while. One day I come home. Opened the garage door, and guess what? My dad's bike was parked in the garage. But not, not where it's normally parked, but parked right in the middle of the garage. Where I couldn't even get the car back in there. Like saying, you're dead. <laughs> Amen? You've been had. I thought I can get away with it. Because I thought I knew when he was coming home. But he tricked me. <laughs> Amen. And I don't think he actually did it on purpose. Maybe he knew. I don't know. Now I get to thinking about it in hindsight. I don't think I was actually putting gas back in the car. So I think he eventually figured it out. Where's all my gas going? Amen. Not quite as smart as I thought I was back in the day. I don't tell anybody else that story. I don't want word getting out that I used to be a bad kid. Amen. But anyway, as we look at that, we begin to understand if we knew the day and the hour, guess what? We wouldn't bother to turn to Jesus until we knew that day and that hour was drawing nigh. But you know, when we look here in the Word of God, the Bible says that He's coming back like a thief. You don't ever know when that thief is coming. He's going to come back, and, we're, and, and, and those who are not ready are going to be caught totally off guard. Now, there are signs. Now, I want us to understand, there, there are signs. We, we looked at some of those last week. If, as we looked in the 2 Timothy chapter 3 last week, we, we looked at you know, the, the, what, what the Apostle Paul said that the end of days were going to look like, how the end of days were going to be. Men are going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Children are going to be disobedient to parents. And, you know, there's that long list uh, in there. And I, you know, we look at it and say, man, is this not the day and age that we're going to be living in, uh, that we are living in? Men will be boastful. They'll be reviled they'll be irreconcilable I mean that whole long list to say man that's the day that we're living in today and as Christians we know the word of God and as Christians we believe the word of God and as Christians we see how wicked this world has become and the world is acting exactly like the word of God says that the world is going to act just prior to Jesus coming back but even Jesus said right here in Matthew chapter 24 Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 24 because Beginning in verse 3, it says right here, And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the signs of your coming at the end of the age? And so, as we look at this, you know, seeing the signs of the end of time, it's not, it, it's not wicked. Even his disciples asked him, and Jesus didn't rebuke his disciples for asking him this question, and then Jesus answered the question and he says in verse 4 and Jesus answered and said to them see to it that no one misleads you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will mislead many and you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars so that you are not frightened for those things must take place but this has not is not yet the end Jesus said this is not yet the end for nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. The beginning of the birth pains. Jesus said this is not yet the end. But these are simply signs of the end. You say, well, nation will rise up against nation. Well, that's, that's always 
happen. That's always taking, taking place. And yes, it has, but it's going to intensify as those birth pains get more and more frequent, as those birth pains get more and more intense. Well, what are birth pains? They're labor pains. Just as a mother gives birth to the child in the natural, she starts with those contractions, she starts with those birth pains, she starts with those labor pains, and they start off and they're spread out, but the closer she gets to the actual delivery of the child, the more frequent they become, the more intense they become. Dale's not in here right now, so I could tell this story. When she was in labor with our first child, they messed up, they, they induced her labor and they messed up and they actually gave her double the medication that they were supposed to, so man, it just hit her like that. And all of a sudden, she got mean. The nurse would walk past the door and she'd say, hey lady, get in here. <laughs> I'd try to wipe her head with a rag, get away from me. <laughs> you know, but she was in intense pain. She was suffering. This world is in intense pain and it's suffering. And as Christians, we see that, and as Christians, our hearts break and our hearts suffer along with that. And so when we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and we look here in the Word of God and we begin to understand uh, what it is that the Apostle Paul is writing, he says and again in verse 1, Now of the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourself know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. It's going to come and there's no doubt about it. You know full well that the day of the Lord is going to come, but it's going to come like a thief in the night. Just like Jesus said that you're not going to know the day and you're not going to know the hour. Nobody knows that. Not even Jesus, the angels. Nobody knows that except for the Father Himself that have set up and established these times and these seasons. Only the Father is the one who has given that appointed time. And when it it comes time he's going to come to his son and he's going to say go get your children and then seven years later go set up your throne here upon this earth and it's going to take place there's no doubt about it but when you look there in verse 3 and you find in verse 3 is in first thessalonians chapter 5 he says right here while they were saying peace and safety then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape now normally, unless like Dale, you get induced with twice the amount of uh, labor pains, you, those labor pains don't come upon you suddenly. There's things that usually warn you, there's signs that warn you, there's things that warn you that it's coming. Now some women have very short labor, some women have very long labor. And none of them know exactly, they just know they're in labor. Now, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're seeing the birth pangs in the world in which we're living in today. We're seeing the labor pains in the world in which we're living in today. I believe that beyond a shadow of a doubt. How long those labor pains are going to last, I don't know, and neither does anybody else. Not even the doctor can go into the waiting room and tell the mother that you have exactly this amount of time. Not even he knows. But the Father knows because He has that day appointed. And then you look in verse 4 and it says there in verse 4, He says, but you, talking to the Christian right there, verse 3 is talking to the lost people. And verse 4 he's talking to the Christian, but you, brethren, are not in the dark that the day would overtake you like a thief. No, you're not in the dark. That day is not going to overtake you like a thief. Why? Because you're saved. Amen? 
You're born again. You're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when the rapture takes place, it, you might not know that the rapture, you might not wake up that morning and, and, and say, you know, the rapture is going to take place today. In fact, you're not going to know the rapture is going to take place that day, but you will be caught up in it. Amen. But it's not going to overtake you like a thief. In other words, to do harm to you. Heather, it's going to be the greatest day of your life. When you're raptured up and there you are meeting Jesus in the clouds of glory. So to us, and we even see as Christians, we see we're aware of the signs in which we're living in. We're aware of the days in which we're living in. But to those who are lost again in verse 3, while they were saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. Peace and safety. Oh, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. You see, the world is living in darkness. And as the world lives in darkness, they don't understand the days in which they're living in. In fact, they're saying peace and safety. Everything is a great joy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 and 36, just as he said that he, that he doesn't know the, do, the day and hour right after he said that, he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them away so will the coming of the Son of Man. Look at that fool building that ark. He has lost his mind. He is a religious nut. He's even dragged his family into it and got his family caught up into it. He's a fool. We don't have all that time. We have time for eating and drinking and, and, and marriage and giving of marriage. And we have time uh, for all of this celebration, just going about the, the, the everyday routines of life, not being bothered by the fact that this fool is over there building the ark. And then all of a sudden the flood comes. And when the flood comes, they realize, you know what? He's not a fool after all. We have made a grave mistake. We are the fools. And there it is in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 3. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. Peace and safety. Oh, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Not a care in the world. But then comes destruction. That day will not overtake those who know Jesus. What day is that? That's the day of the Lord. No, no, it's not going to overtake them. They have made their preparation. They are ready. They know Jesus Christ. Friend, do you know Jesus today? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt That you know, that you know, that you know. You know, when we begin to think about and understand Jesus is coming, we begin to think about and understand. The Bible tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's coming. Even warns us of some of the signs of his coming. But something that we need to understand 
that the surest of all signs. The surest of all signs there in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus himself said that the Son of Man will not return until the gospel has been preached to all creation. Jesus will not return until the gospel has been preached to all creation. If you're here today and you don't know that you know that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior friend, you better get ready. You don't know the day and the hour it could be today. It could be tonight. You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. It's going to be a surprise all on purpose. (laughs) So today is the day of salvation. But if you're here today as Miss Doyce and Brother Derwin comes on up for this time of invitation, if you're here today and as each one of you stand and you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, friend, are you busy sharing the gospel? We just prayed a minute ago that God would give every single one of us as a church a burden, a broken heart for lost people. The most assured sign of when Jesus is coming back is when the gospel has been preached to all, every nation. And that hasn't happened yet. There's nations, there's people groups that have yet to hear the gospel. And there is only one organization, there's only one institution, there's only one people that God has given charge to that task to. That's the church. That's us. It's not Washington's responsibility. Thank God for that. Amen. They managed to mess everything up. But it's our responsibility. My responsibility. It's your responsibility. Not just Brother Doug and Sister Diane's responsibility over there in the Philippines. Apart from us and other churches supporting them being over there, not just financially but prayerfully. Many other ways, in many ways we can. They couldn't even be over there. It's our responsibility for them. Are you taking that serious? Or is it just an afterthought? And when I ask you, and I'm going to close in this, when I ask you to put in your heart and mind of somebody that you are personally going to invite, it doesn't have to just be one somebody, it could be a lot of somebodies, that you are personally going to invite. Bring. Drag them here kicking and screaming if you have to to heaven's gates and hell's flames. And by the way, you don't have to wait to them. You can bring them next Sunday. Amen? That they're going to be your responsibility. Are you taking that mandate seriously? I pray that you are. Amen? I pray that you are. Again, this altar's open. Those cards are in there. You come. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you come. This altar's open, friend. Let's use this time for altar call. Let's pray for those lost people to come to know Jesus. Let's pray for broken hearts and a burden for them. Amen. When we walk with the the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way 
while we knew his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no But to trust and obey.